was we're, we're calling the village council meeting to order this is a special meeting thursday september 26 um, to discuss some asset management issues among other things um, utility rates water tower proposal sanitary sewer projects our cap representative will be in attendance how about that we'll start with the pledge of allegiance I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for everyone that chose to attend. We'll get started. Okay, um, I, my name is Julie Ward, and it's going to be a little awkward because I'm not used to setting down when I do a presentation and having my back to people, but I'll try my best. I'm going to do the first part of the presentation, and then I'm going to turn it over to Roberta for the, the um, second part of the presentation. RCAP has been working with the village of Hicksville to put together their asset management plan and program documentation um, to comply with Senate Bill 2, which is a new... Ohio Environmental Protection Agency um, regulation. So what we're going to go over today is just kind of a summary of what we found, what you're currently doing, um, recommendations for improvements, and, and also looking at, at what those recommendations and your capital improvement plan might have on your rates. Okay. So first of all, really asset management is a change in philosophy. Um, currently, we tend to run particularly our underground assets um, until they fail. So what we really want to do is change the governing board and management's philosophy into actively managing that asset as it ages, taking care of it, and then budgeting for its eventual replacement. As I've been working around the state, I, I notice people's rates tend to cover their operations. Some include a little bit of maintenance. Very few include any kind of replacement planning. So what we're really trying to do is put that management and replacement back into our operating, the O, M, and R, back into our rates. So currently, as I said, we kind of have a let's not fix it until it breaks philosophy. And the problem with that is, as we all know, as something ages, it needs more maintenance. And as capital, particularly ut utilities and water utilities, are really very large capital investments, we want to make sure that we're properly taking care of them as they age to extend that useful life. And part of that is making sure you have sufficient revenue in order to properly care and keep your infrastructure in proper working order. Oops. So what I like to use as a car example because a lot of us don't necessarily and the public doesn't really understand all the infrastructure components that are there for them to turn on their faucet 24-7. Um, I like to use the analogy of a car. You have a car, you don't change any of the oil, you don't do any preventive maintenance, you run it to failure, it's not going to last very long. You do some what we call preventive maintenance, you check your fluids, you change your oils, you're going to get more miles out of it. You do predicted maintenance, and this is where you want to like change your air filter, you want to look at your tires and your brakes, you want to basically get, because they're way more expensive than oil change, so you want to make sure you get as much useful life out of those tires or those brakes before it fails. And that's the same kind of philosophy we're looking at for asset management. You do some things preventive, and then you want to save for and have some funds on hand to do predictive maintenance to extend the useful life of that facility. And these are just the maintenance strategies that we talk about in asset management planning. I said preventive, you want to make sure that you're servicing and keeping your equipment in proper working order, including your valves and hydrants and your lines. Predictive maintenance are those that activities that help determine the condition of that asset and predict when it's going to need repaired or rehabbed. Something that you wouldn't necessarily save for every year, like major maintenance on your wells, rehabbing your towers, and maybe in a five-year, 10-year, 20-year cycle, but you want to have cash on hand. So you want to make sure you're kind of estimating those needs and, and, and saving for that as well. 
What we tend to do most is reactive. We run into failure, and then when it breaks, we fix it, and that's really expensive. Emergency, because when do emergencies happen? They happen on the weekend. They happen at night. They're overtime. You can't get proper equipment. You can't play, You can't fix it correctly. You have to band-aid it. So one of the things is if you have less emergency repair and more planned repair, you're also going to save money as well. And then what we often do is we defer that maintenance. We can't afford it this year. We're going to wait till next year because we are not going to increase our rates to pay for that. So, And then guess what? Next year you don't have the money for it either. So it keeps getting pushed down the road. This is just kind of a short summary of all the steps we did in the asset management planning pro um, project. Note that a lot of systems do asset management. Um, what we looked at, what we do is try to come in and say what you're currently doing and what do you need to do a better job. So we went through many of these steps, maybe not all of them, in um, developing your asset management plan. I briefly want to talk about level of service goals. It's something that we used to focus more on, but with the EPA Senate Bill 2, they kind of stepped away with what we would really think of as a level of service goal. And this is basically the utility setting their goals and then determining what kind of revenue you need to, activities and revenue you need to meet those goals. So for example, compliance. Well, obviously probably one of your goals would be to stay in um, compliance with public health laws and what do you have to do to invest in doing that. Um, conservation is one. Let's say we want to have a water loss of no more than 10 percent. What do we have to invest to meet that goal? So these are all, you, you, we used to come up with our goals based on um, and then decide what is the right rate that we need to have to meet those goals. What's our sufficient revenue to meet those goals? What EPA came decided is you're going to have operational metrics that you're going to have to track. They set two of those. You got to set the rest. So what we're proposing in the plan, talking with your operators and working with Kent, is your operating ratio has to be under one. That basically says you have a positive cash flow. That's an EPA metric that they're going to want to look at every year. Um, total cost per service connection, that was something that, that the utility got to come up with. We had a cost of about 750000 based on the pro forma that, that um, Roberta will be presenting. Water main breaks per 10 miles of pipe, boil advisories, you know, Jessica was like, well, it's zero. We want to make sure that we don't have any boil advisories. So um, unaccounted for water loss, 15% is an industry standard. You guys are right around that, which is really good. But you also understand that if you have a 15% water loss, that means you're operating your treatment plant for almost two months of water production that you're not collecting any revenues on. So even a 15% can be an expensive water, uh, water loss goal. Maintenance tasks per year on planned versus unplanned vertical assets. Um, it's hard for me to explain this because I'm not exactly sure what they want either. <laughs> it was kind of a strange goal, but, but um, basically you would do at least 24 a year above ground maintenance task on your infrastructure. And the other goal that you set was to have no more than six complaints a year, not on your rates, but on the quality of your water. So it's a customer service goal in a sense that the quality of your water, um, people aren't complaining that it's, uh, you know, it's not clear or they don't have adequate pressure or those kinds of things. The administrative review, these are just the things we looked at. Your legal authority, your rules and regs, your organizational structure, do you have job descriptions, um, do you have your contingency plan up to date, some kind of just kind of paper review and, and compiling this information so when EPA comes in, it's all in one place. They can look at it and you, you've covered that piece of the asset management plan. So one of the things we look at as far as your rules and regs, and this, this primarily deals with systems that have their meters in the building. I think most of your meters are at the curb, right. like 80% or something. So it, it's, it's not as critical for you because if you have a meter at the curb, you're not paying for water loss on that service line. If that meter is at the building, then the condition of that service line and making sure that it's leak fee, 
leak free and in proper working order it is very much a concern of the utility. And so one of the things we look at is making sure in your rules and regs that you have proper wording where you can, you know, how do you want that service line installed? There's procedures for that and, and technical specs for that. You ought to be able to do maintenance and inspection. Um, the other thing we look at is the backflow prevention along with any written and billing collection policies. So most of your rules and regs are in pretty good shape. I notice a lot in, in communities that I work with that there's really no language in there that they have to mandatorily connect to your system. Um, so, you know, I, I underline that. I see a lot of rules and regs that don't address that. And people are like, well, nobody can drill a well. And I'm like, well, where does it say that? So that's the only thing I had to point out there. So the next step that we did is we did a GIS asset inventory of your water utility. So we went in and shot lines and hydrants and valves and curb stops and, and your above ground um, network infrastructures. We also then had to try and add installation date, condition based on age or year of installation, construction material, we had to do size capacity, we collected all this information on each individual asset. You have over 900 assets in your system. And so every little dot you see there in line segment, that means something that your water utility staff have to take care of. They have to track the maintenance. They have to figure out when it needs replaced. So often I think we think of, oh, we have a water treatment plan or we have a distribution system. But really they have 900 different assets that they have to take care of. And that's just the capital stuff. That's not the smaller stuff. Um, with a replacement value of around $23 million. And I know you can't see that map very well. There will be a better map in your report. So your summary, you have about 1,500 connections, 1,519 connections. Um, 162 of those are commercial or other. By far the majority are, one, are residential connections. You have over 120,000 linear feet of underground pipe, which is about 23 miles, anywhere from one inch to 12 inch at capacity. 167 hydrants, 305 main valves, one water storage tower totaling 400,000 gallons with one backup, and your average daily flow is around 270,000 gallons per day. The capacity of your storage is good. You have over 24 hours of storage, which is based on your average daily flow, which is something EPA wants to see. You meet that criteria. And your treatment capacity is only 31% of your average daily flow. I mean, you kind of want to look at peaking too, but it, it tells me you have a lot of capacity in your storage and in your treatment for growth. And then your water loss for 2017 was around 15% and Jesse does a good job of tracking that. I do need to get the 18 figures, but I haven't done that yet. Then I went in and I looked at the distribution of your, the summary of the age of your pipe, basically. And I know that's a little hard to see, but around 40% of your pipe is believed to be original. Um, Around 27% was installed in the 2000s, and if we break that down, it's um, from 2000 to 2010 was around 17%, and from 2010 to 2019 was 10%. So Jesse looked at those numbers for me because I grouped too, too many decades in that one, that one pie chart. But you can see you have had some investment in the 90s. You've had, had some investment in the 2000s. And you still have about 40% of your pipe that's original. And that's just a summary. 40%, you know, 80 years old. Now remember what, I, and just because it's old doesn't mean it isn't working properly. But one of the things is you want to pay attention to that more maybe on a maintenance issue than you might your newer pipe because you know it's going to need more maintenance. And you know you want to keep track of that condition better and, and try to identify leaks and those kinds of things. 
Um, we, we kind of rated the condition based on age, but as you implement the program, you know, Jesse and the, and the staff can go back and update those about what we see in real field condition because it doesn't always age the way it's supposed to in the field. And I, all, I always like to look at the age of hydrants versus of our underground infrastructure because we tend to take care of our above ground infrastructure better and this kind of um, um, shows you that in a sense on your left. Those are your hydrants that have been installed since 2000. I think if I can see that is like 40 some percent. Where, where the percentage of hydrants that are thought to be original are only 11 percent. So if you kind of compare that to the, the age of your original distribution, you can see we tend to invest in things that we can see um, and keep the above ground structures in proper working order. So the next thing we looked at is best management practices of, of um, what you're doing as far as preventive <coughs> and predictive monitoring. And you're really doing all of them. The, the most recent one that the EPA is so concerned about is the valve condition assessment and maintenance and you guys are exercising your valves. So you're doing water leaks, um, they're tracking water loss, you have aggressive program for leak location and repair when they are reported. You also periodically get leak detection services, so somebody, third party vendor comes in and goes through the entire system to try to identify leaks. You're doing hydrant flushing and condition assessment and you know, as the data shows, you have replaced a lot of your hydrants. Um, you're doing flushing, you have an active backflow prevention program. I always put customer education up there because we tend not to spend a whole lot of time on educating our customers on what a great deal they're getting in their water system. Um, as I said, these are the types of things that you're currently doing and you're also implementing a meter replacement program. Those are all things EPA wants to see you doing and remember your meters are your cash register. So making sure that those get replaced and then planning for their next replacement are very important because if as they age, they slow down, you recover less revenue. The only thing that the valve exercising program is being performed in-house um, the only thing I added to the operating budget was around $2,500 to continue to stay in the GIS cooperative. Or, you know, do something where you keep your mapping updated and you also can track maintenance on that particular program. So, really, we didn't add a whole lot to that. And then I'm going to turn it over to Roberta. Okay. Can do that. I was going through that pretty quickly. So uh, well, I just have a question about this one: valve exercising program to be performed in house, which it is now. Right. So what are you recommending exactly? Well, I I put to be performed in house, and I and I just pointed out oh, you're already doing that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And I sort of separate it out because it's not a cost. Right. With a, a lot of this is <coughs> cost based. That's not an outside cost to us because we are performing it in house. Okay. Right. Thank you. And her last statement with the GIS system, she said, we can use it to track maintenance. We are using it to track maintenance already. Okay. All of 2018. Okay. That's good. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very good. Yeah, you guys are way ahead of the curve on pretty much every other community we've seen um, in these situations. So. <laughs> So this was actually yes, kind of a joy for us. Into the microphone. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Laying into the microphone. <laughs> Do you want to join us, Ron? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so this is the part that you're probably all on edge for. Um, you know, maintaining these assets come at a cost, and we're going to talk a little bit about how we're going to, you know, help you recover some of those costs and how we're going to move forward with making sure that it's sustainable. Um, so one of the things that we recommend is the short-lived asset replacement reserve for your predictive maintenance that Julie talked about. And as she mentioned, when you think about that in terms of a car, these are the things that you know are sort of bigger cost items that you have to take care of, um, like getting your towers inspected and all those things that she mentioned before. Um, 
as compared to the predictive maintenance, or I'm sorry, yeah, the, the preventative maintenance, which is the tool that we use to do this monitoring. So as you are performing preventative maintenance activities on some of your assets, you'll begin to see how the asset is performing and you'll be able to keep track of when you think that asset might fail. The idea is to run that thing as far as you can and get it replaced right before it does actually fail on you. So um, you want to suck as much useful life out of it as you can <coughs> and you do that through performing these maintenance activities. Um, the, um, and on the predictive maintenance, we want to try to recover 100% of that cost through your revenues because we want to be able to purchase the components that we need to do that on a regular basis and not have to worry about getting financing for that because they should be relatively you know, cheaper. They're not going to be a huge capital investment, but they are going to have a cost. Um, <clears throat> When we're looking at your longer term asset rehab and replacement, we um, are talking about those large capital improvements projects, things that have a generally a useful life of more than 20 years. And we use, when we, when we go through this process initially, we use an age-based condition assessment to determine how long we think that asset is going to continue to work for you. And as Julie mentioned, you want to be working through, as you're out in the field, updating those conditions assessments based on you know, the field condition of that asset and what you know the maintenance has been on that asset, because that will extend that useful life. So that will help you know, shift costs maybe from one year to the next as you're looking at your long-term strategies for saving money. Um, the asset management plan that we've developed for you is the document that we use to, um, or that we use to document the condition assessment as well as identifying the reserves that we need in order to keep that asset in good working order. And we understand that self-funding of capital replacement projects at 100% is not going to be, you know, a doable or a realistic goal for you and we don't expect that. We just want you to be aware of what might be coming down the pike. <clears throat> So in terms of the targeting for the capital improvement reserve for your system, um, these are the main components that we have identified in terms of large investments. And over the estimated useful life of those investments as it stands now, we're looking at about $20 million of cost to replace those. We typically recommend that you target 20% of that in order to cover any pre-construction type of cost if you needed to hire an engineer or something like that so that you're not borrowing right off the top or if you do have some money to put in place to match other funding sources if you can get you know low interest loans or grants and based on that we have an escrow target of 20 percent over 50 years for your large capital improvements okay um, so the capital improvement program, you know, we've used this to identify what those investments need to be, but we know that we can't wait, you know, 20 or 50 years to do some of this stuff. So we need to try and identify how we're going to move things around and what kind of, uh, re 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 excuse me, revenue targets we're going to put in place in order to cover the costs of this program. Let me hand out for you now. Um, thank you. So what we have put together for you is um, a short-term capital improvement plan. Julie and I sat down with Jesse and Kent and went through what are we looking at over the next five to ten years that we know needs to happen with this, with this system. And based on this short-term capital improvement plan, we've got about $388,000 and I've got a sheet coming around so you can see it a little bit better um, of things that we know we're going to need to pay out of the out of the revenues that the system currently um, collects. And <clears throat> I'm sorry, I can't reach us. Does anybody have an extra sheet? Yet? <laughs> There's some okay. lining. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. Thanks. That's why we need that. So when you're looking at this at this sheet, um, the top are the large projects, because you guys have that village capital projects fund that receives money through income tax. So we went through and identified the projects that would likely get funded out of that fund, and we've taken them out of consideration for the revenue targets that we're recommending for you today. 
the um, bottom part is what we're calling the water improvement fund and that is the projects that are going to need to be funded out of your operating revenues essentially so in 2020 we actually have several items that really need to be done because they've sort of been deferred as Julie mentioned before because we just didn't feel like there was money available to do that so we're going to try to get those things done because we don't want to end up in an emergency repair situation so it's, it's a little top heavy in the first year but it gets it gets smaller as time goes on and of course you know this is our best estimate as where we are right now things are going to come up you know over the next two years five years ten years so you know we have to be sure to build in a little bit so we can stay flexible in uh, making repairs so um, when we make our rate recommendations and I'm sure many of you have heard a lot of this from me before but we'll just go over it again um, <laughs> Some of the, the way we start is we collect some bunch of data from, from your fiscal officer and we look at you know the past five years of revenues and expenses. And we like to try to analyze all this historical data so we can kind of try to see what the trends are in terms of how you are spending your money, what's happening with your system. Um, then we sort of document and put together what we call a typical year operating budget and that sort of allows us to normalize those costs over the five years. Um, then we build in our asset management planning and our capital improvements plans and as Julie mentioned on the asset management planning side the only thing we really added was the GIS component because that's going to allow you to continue to uh, implement your program. Um, we also add in inflation, and so when I built this budget, Kent and Cheryl and, and Jesse and I sat down, and he gave me all of the inflationary cost increases that he was aware of in terms of insurance and benefits and wages and things of that nature, and then the rest we just apply some industry standards to. It's typically 3 to 5 percent, but we need to recognize that there is an inflationary impact with all of the, the things that you do here in the, in the village. And then we, we set those budgets for the reserve accounts, and we... Um, run that out over 10 years and I have a big spreadsheet that I'm going to share with you but it's a lot so I, I want you to take it home and you know digest it a little bit instead of trying to do it here today so I'll give it to you in a couple Mr. of minutes. Can I ask you a question please? Yes you can Ron. Um, we've got the West High Street uh, water line replacement <clears throat> that's supposed to be uh, partnered in or incorporated with the sewer at the exact same time are we missing uh, half a million dollars for that? No, because it, I'm only considering the water side of it in this analysis. Okay. So is that you know, something we can talk about okay. outside of this? Okay. <clears throat> okay. So one of the most important things that you need to think about is safeguarding your capital reserves. You know, we always recommend that you set aside specific escrow accounts, whether you put it as a separate fund or a line item and didn't show it as a transfer, however you want to do it, but that money needs to be pulled out of your operating because you know, unrestricted money gets spent. And it also makes it easier for your fiscal officer when the auditor comes and, you know, they're asking, why do you have $2 million in your water operating fund? You know, those are questions, and those are questions that people in the village are going to ask. So it helps you to be able to explain to people why you're collecting the money that you have, why you're saving the money that you have, and it helps with transparency and just keeping your records in order so that there aren't any questions as to what that money is, is used for. So that as council members come and go, you know, people will understand that this is not a slush fund. It's not something that we're, you know, just collecting for the sake of collecting. It has a purpose. And you can use that asset management plan to identify where that money is going to go. So that's probably the most important thing that you can do. Okay, so in terms of the implementation, again, we have the $2,500 for the GIS membership. If you want to stay a member of the cooperative, um, we have a, we are showing a one-time transfer because you have a pretty significant fund balance right now. We're recommending a transfer of 215000 from the operating into that capital improvements fund. And that will cover the... Oh, what was the 215 for? That was just the, the to set up that account. To set up the account. And right. to get your operating balance in a more, right. I would say, normal or targeted level. Right. Is this just another line item, Cheryl? Mm -hmm. It's just from one line item in the water to another line no, item. No, it's restricted. Right, but I mean, it's not a whole separate fund. No. I, 
Oh, well, I would recommend you set up a whole separate fund. Mm -hmm. you Just a question I had. <laughs> but right. um, and and here's why: if you have if you're trying to save for a car payment or a house payment, do you save your money in your checking account? No. You'd never save money if you kept it in your checking account. You want to set up a savings account for those okay. really large. Now, some auditors or some fiscal people don't want to do it because, you know, but if you don't, if you just put a line item into your operating, then what happens is council tends to say, well, we just won't. Sidewalks. Yeah, you, we're <laughs> just not going to do that because we don't want to raise our rates and if and we can lower that amount in that operator in that capital improvement line item and then our operating budget will be. They'll there. use it for something else. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's a Cheryl thing. So. <laughs> but the important thing is that you use it for capital projects and how you do that. Right. Is up to you. It's up to you. Um, Thank you. Because when we're setting these targets, we're looking at operating fund balance targets and we're looking at capital improvement fund targets. So we typically recommend that you have six months of operating as a fund balance so that you can you know, keep your cash flows positive. If some big expense shows up unexpectedly, you're covered and you don't have to try and transfer money from other funds. So part of the reason for that transfer to set up the capital improvement fund was also to target that operating fund balance that we recommend. Your operating expenses are about $400,000 a year, so we recommend trying to keep that around 200000 You know, it's going to ebb and flow, but that's, you know, a target for you to look at. And then we're also recommending a $205,000 transfer to cover those capital improvement projects that you know we've identified here, as well as some of the longer term things, that $80,000 that we identified that we're going to need every year to, to start setting aside for our long term capital investment. So, so that's you add to this count every year then, the savings account? Yes, every year you're going to transfer the 205000 or you know we're going to adjust it for inflation. So every year that's going to get transferred. And when will this start? In 2020. <laughs> Remember, $23 million in assets. Right. Okay. So, again, the budgeting for the capital projects was around $388,000 over 10 years. So that's built into that $200,000. And we also added in an additional $52,000, and we can play around with this. When we were talking about the Wellfield project, um, we were kind of kicking around, do we want to borrow money for that, or do we want to pay for that out of the capital projects fund or out of the water operating fund? So Kent asked me to run some numbers on how much it would cost if we were to take out a loan to purchase the land and develop the well field. So I've got you in for $52,000 over a 10 year period to do that. Now we can take that out of the estimates and that will change some things with the recommendations, but that's something for you guys to talk about and decide on. Um, and I can always make that adjustment later, but that's why that amount is in there. And then again, we added in the inflationary increases that we've talked about. So, before I move on to the recommendation, the rate recommendation, do you have any other questions about any of this at this point? As far as moving with that, uh, do you recommend us doing that or do you recommend us just paying for it? The 52, the, the loan? Paying for their well fields. I mean, if you borrow the money, it helps you with your cash flow a little bit because if you're going to spend, what was it, what did we estimate for that, like a million dollars, something like that? So between development or land purchase and development, you're pretty close to that yep. number. So that's, that's a big hit to your funds. So that's why we sort of broke that out because that would be a long-term capital project in general. I mean, that's going to have a useful life of more than 20 years. That's where I'm not seeing where we're coming up with 215000 uh, right off the get-go when we're right. struggling to come up with a million. Well, that was just to help you fund, because you have a healthy fund balance right now. That was just to help you start funding the capital improvement account itself. And... Um, well, we'll actually see that in a moment. Yeah. Okay. I mean, she hands something else. Yeah, okay. when I hand the sheet out, you'll, <laughs> you'll see it. Um, any other questions on any of that? Okay. 
So, in order to do the things that we've recommended here to you today, we would be proposing a rate increase that would raise your rates anywhere from $3 in 2020 on average, based on your average bill, to $6 in 2021 based on the 15%, which I know sounds like a lot, but when you think about it in terms of dollars, it's not significant. So we're proposing these rate increases for the first three years just to help you build up those revenues and those reserves that we've recommended here for you. So the average bill is going to go up $3 in 2020, $5 in 2021, and $6 in 2022. So that's going to be the impact over three years. Then we always recommend inflationary increases of 3% every year, which you've been doing with your um, your volume charges, but we have not been doing that on the base charges. So we are proposing across the board increases on the base and the per thousand <coughs> charges. Um, and, and just so that you're aware, even at the end of that three years, you guys are still paying less than a penny for a gallon of water. I don't know anybody, any other system that has, you know, that kind of a return on, on the investment. That's a really good bargain if you want to look at it that way for, for residents. It's eight tenths of a cent for a gallon of water that residents are paying. So We also run a, a scenario where we're looking at com the combined rates because this becomes important when you're looking at those capital improvements. Um, in terms of being able to be competitive with low interest loan funding and grant programs, they always look at a uh, percentage of your rates have to be at a certain percentage of your median household income before you would be competitive or even in some cases eligible for grant funding. So this is sort of where we've struggled over the years because the water rates have always been well under the thresholds for that. Now when we look at your combined rates it's a little bit different story but if we're just looking at the water rates it's a little bit it's a little bit dif more difficult. So for 2019 we have calculated that your rates are around 2.42%. The threshold is typically somewhere between 2.6 and 3%. So you're kind of just hovering around that, that threshold. And as we in implement the rate increases over the three years, now we're creeping up to 2.7 with your combined rates. And, and that would put you in a more competitive position when we're looking for grant funding for both water and, and sewer projects. So this is just for your information so that you understand with the competitive nature of you know the loan and grant world where you're where you're sitting. And who knows that's that could change over three years. They continue to creep those thresholds up a little bit. Okay. Um, any questions on the rate adjustments? Comments, concerns, rights. The other thing is they change that MHI yearly. They do. That's and if right. You're right close to the threshold, and all of a sudden your MHI goes up. You may not meet that threshold again. Right. That's a good point. We do count on funding to help with well, our for everything. For yeah. everything. <coughs> so that number is important to us that we stay in that eligibility eligibility range. Because if we're too low, it is assumed, well, if you don't charge people for it, we're not giving the same money. Uh, I was going to say, I think that's what council is going to have to pound to the public. You're not just collecting this for the fun of it. Right. I want to know how we avoid the public lynchings. <laughs> Well, education. Yeah. Understanding why that brings me to my to my last slide. <laughs> <laughs> Avoiding public lynching. Yes. Maybe we should change our last slide to that. <laughs> um, you know, as Julie mentioned, we do a really poor job of educating the public on the good work that we do in terms of providing them clean drinking water and, you know, the wastewater services and everything that the village does. So it's really important to make sure that you're, you know, doing a lot of public education and outreach to let people know, hey, we've got really great water here. I know 
people may or may not believe that, but we need to let them know why we have to do these rate increases. And this is why, because if you want to continue to, you know, have safe, affordable drinking water, then we have to continue to invest in this system. I mean, our water and sewer systems are the biggest asset that this community has, and we've already invested millions of dollars in it, so it doesn't make sense to let it start to fall apart now. So we need to make people understand that the rates are sufficient to cover the, the capital investment needs of the system. And that's another reason why separating out those capital improvement funds from those operating funds helps with that because it's, it's transparent. These funds are earmarked to do X, Y, and Z. And here's the list of projects that we have for this year. So keeping all of that stuff available for people to look at is helpful. You're, you're going to get complaints, and that's just the nature of people in business. But if you can at least help you know, massage that a little bit, you're going to be in, in better shape as you move forward. Um, and, and make sure that they understand that everybody in, this, in the community is paying their fair share for the water system. It's not that just the businesses are getting hit or just the residents are getting hit, but the fact that you guys sitting around this table have to pay these rates as well. So you're making decisions to raise your own rates. And I think sometimes that gets a little lost in the discussion too. So just being very aware and, and trying to provide good education, good customer service will help in those difficult situations. I got one question, probably for Ken. Now the rate adjustment or increases on here, what about the people on State Route 18 that's not in the corporation limit? Uh, the Okay, so here's our, our spreadsheet for you to pull over and chew on. I know. I can tell them They had the opportunity to do it. Well, it's not just them. There's a few others, too. Bring it up, too. Right. I mean, it was just... I gave when they have enough... I'm just curious. Yeah, I didn't know that good. theirs would be double. You need one? Yeah. You have yours? Or yep, I gave Larry one. Okay. So. I have mine. Okay. Thank everybody else. <coughs> so... <coughs> Just briefly for me to kind of go through this for you <laughs> so that hopefully when you have a chance to look at it. Um, we have the actuals on the left-hand side here. This is the 2014 through the 2018 numbers. We developed the typical year. The 2020 estimates are based on Kent's budgeting and his um, inflationary increases that we talked about. And those were carried forward from 2021 to 2029. So the revenues are... We, it's hard to sort of, you had a lot of miscellaneous non-operating types of revenues in 2018, so I sort of just dismissed those, and I'm looking primarily at the um, customer rent, and I don't know what this other miscellaneous non-operating cost was, but we put a little bit in there, too, because it looks like you get some every year. Yeah, that. it's kind of like not, I mean, this significant, by far the most majority, is based on user charges. But you also get some kind of non, non-user non charge revenue right. that you wanted to account for as well. Mm -hmm. So the, the expenses all um, continue on to the second page. And if you move down to this green line where it says improved maintenance budget, that's the GIS services that we talked about. Um, and then this yellow line item is the transfer to the capital improvement reserve. So we're showing the $420,000 transfer in 2020. It does give you a, a negative fund balance, or I'm sorry, a negative operating income for that year. But your fund balance is, you know, around that 200000 that we told you we were targeting. And we've just moved that down to the bottom under the brown line. That's your capital improvement fund that you're going to establish. So the first line is showing all the transfers from the operating going into that, and then your capital improvements are shown out here on the left. And after 20, what is that? Let me line that up. Uh, 2025, you know, there's really not much left because we haven't identified our capital improvements past that year. So that's something that, you know, Jesse will be continuing to build on as you implement the asset management program. Mm. So how do you not get lynched? 
Remember, who pays more than less than a cent of a gallon for anything? <laughs> Gas, mouthwash, milk. I mean, you know, people say that's, oh, that's not really our. Uh, speaking for myself and, and addressing people on the street when they jump me about it. Uh, <clears throat> they don't say about our water bill. It, it's our water and sewers together. Right. Mm -hmm. Our sewer is a bit salty, mm -hmm. and that's what they unload on you about. Yeah, uh, that's true. It, it's hard to go, okay, it costs you a little bit more to go number two, but number one's really cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't well, work I that way. I think that your sewer, probably to clean the water, isn't more than a penny a gallon either, or right. not much more. But <laughs> you have dealt with John Q. Public enough times to know that it doesn't flow as well as that. Right. <laughs> right. And the other thing is, like, you know, once again, this gives you some numbers to back up what you're doing in the sense that they're like, oh, you don't need that much money. Well, you have $23, $24 million. So having a little fun balance of $200,000 is it's pencil dust. Well, what, what really sounds good to me <clears throat> is uh, uh, a one or two or even three nights of education to have people like yourselves to address we invite our general populace to join us in a meeting and and discuss this, ask questions. If you want to hold a public meeting, I'm happy to do that. Will it be something different that they're going to be able to watch right now? By yeah. going to YouTube or watching the cable TV channel? Will it be different? I mean, it would allow them to ask questions. I mean, they're just, if they're just they watching could. it on TV, they're yeah. not... Watching it on TV is, uh, is unlike reading in a book where you can go back and continue to read it as many times as you need to fully understand it. Uh. I mean, I know what, what we're asking you to do is difficult. I know these decisions don't come easy. But, you know, it's for the long-term benefit of the village, really, to make sure that we're operating. Oh, definitely. I know definitely. you understand that. So it's just you got to go with, with the, the heart. The other thing I was doing this and one mayor said, Oh, that's just the cost of a couple pizzas. I thought, well, you know, I never thought of it that way. But like, if you try to normalize stuff, right? You know, fifty dollars a year. What, what? What is that really? Yeah. Right, but when you order a pizza and it's been ten dollars for the last five years, once a week, and then you walk in the next week and it's twelve fifty, you're like, whoa, 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 why? Why did you increase your pizza price? But uh, I was going to ask, you know, and you work with a lot of communities. Um, and they cut, you know, the EPA come up with this new regulations and everything with asset management plans. Are you finding communities, and you, we talked about our community in general, but uh, communities are falling behind because they don't want to raise their rates and they don't want to help their infrastructure. And they, if it breaks, they fix it temporarily or they mandate it and then they hope it doesn't break and then it, it breaks even worse down the road and or more in disrepair. Um, you know, and, and doing this type of cost analysis and, and future being proactive, it does cost more money, or you try to collect more money to be proactive mm -hmm. in any regards. Um, the, the ones I've done in the past are kind of, though, you know, systems are widely different, I have seen, you know, 10, 15, 20, 25% recommendations to get people on track with an improved asset management program. Right. We've looked at anywhere from about 25% of revenues to 40% of revenues going into capital improvement reserve depending on whether they wanted to fund debt out of that reserve or they wanted to pay debt service out of a different. So it, it's not a whole lot different than what you guys are looking at right, right now. Um, I read maybe a year ago or something that on average something that AWD at WA or what they put out that said they've seen water rates, water and sewer rates increase about 40% since 2000 on the national trend. You know, when I first started in this business, everybody had low water rates about 20 years ago. I don't see that very often anymore. You guys are one of the few ones I see that have what I consider pretty low water rates. Um, and so that's, you know, I'm seeing a, about that. I've, I've worked with a couple of systems that have had an annual 3% inflationary increase on their rates, and they've had it for 10 or 15 years. 
And so those adjustments are not as high because they've been adjusting them every year. Mm -hmm. And probably if I went back, if we went back and looked at the last time you had a rate increase, and if we'd applied an 3% inflationary increase, probably would be more than what we're recommending right now. I mean, what we see is you want to do the right thing for your community and not increasing rates. But what you're really doing is putting off a bigger job right. down the road. We're a business and we got to run away from business. Can I also point out something? We've had a ton of meetings and they ask me questions and I answer them and it's, a lot of it's been overwhelming because it's a, it's a lot of new regulation, even beyond what you guys are seeing here on that administrative end. Um, but as Roberta pointed out, our projects that we laid out go through 2024. There are projects beyond that, and we have to acknowledge that our water plant itself, which I know this community can, that's the new water plant. It is. <laughs> However, it's approaching 40 years old. So is it failing right now? No. No, it's great today. But it's something we have to consider, and that is not at all a cheap investment that we are going to have to reinvest in somewhere, maybe not in our 10-year plan, but 20-year plan, who knows? They really have a 40 to 60 year life. So again, there are, there are other projects that aren't on this immediate list that are still out there that we need to remember are still out there, not get bogged down just in what we're seeing one, two, three years. There's still a lot more to come. And my fear is that we're good now, but if we don't continue to be prepared and predictive for these things, we're gonna fall behind the curve really, really quick. And you know, most public doesn't really even notice that 3%. It's pennies on the dollar every year. It's like, why are you? Why did we have nothing? And then all of a sudden, you're raising it five. That's what we can be doing. So if you can just take a bite, <laughs> take a little hit to get to that three percent, and then institute that three percent. Stick with it. Yeah, stick, stick with it. it. But do we need to jump at fifteen percent the first three years and we get an average it out more later? Or you well, well, you. Know, we, we ran several different, you know, scenarios in that way, and you were running negative operating balances every year for a long time, and that creates problems. I mean, it was like a five or six year thing before we were positive again, and that creates problems for your fiscal officer and dealing with the auditor. So we want to make sure that, you know, we're having positive fund balances every year. Yes, we're going to have a negative balance, a big negative balance that first year, which will be easy to explain. Um, and then the next year, there still is a small negative fund balance, but, you know, we've got to get you back positive right. as soon as possible. I'm just thinking about getting rid of the sticker shock. Well, well you know, that goes. That also is back right. tied to the funding. Right. If they don't think we're paying enough, they're not going to give you any free money. Oh, well, that's, that's true. Yeah, that's and that's what I was going to say, Larry, too, to, to add to what they're doing. We're going to stop uh, qualifying for the funding. The funding is what we use to stay on top of the projects we are currently Early doing. doing. Mm -hmm. And if you look, like Roberta said, the first few years are are weighted pretty heavily, but these are projects that have been deferred for so long, mm -hmm. we can't keep putting them off. That's why the rate increase has to be top heavy. We can't keep deferring the things we've been deferring. For the same reason we've been deferring them all along, we don't want to add any rate increase. We're all rate payers, we understand, we don't want it. Sometimes you have to do what you need on top of what you want. <laughs> and, but we've already deferred these things for a while now. If we keep doing it, it becomes a bigger problem. Right. And you, you take a bigger problem, and then you don't qualify for funding anymore. Now what do you do? Yep. <coughs> <Should I? laughs> you take out a big fat loan, and then you raise everybody's rates 40%. <laughs> That's what happens. <laughs> I mean, we could run that scenario in the way you wanted, but having done this for a while and running 500 million scenarios, it's kind of like, you still need to collect this much money. Right. How, how you, you cut the pie, you know, maybe you spread it out longer, but that means you're gonna have 
those increases over a longer period of time. So more about the funding. <coughs> and, and yeah, and then as you know. Well, these projects even cost more money. You you push right. them out yeah. three years, five years, right. and no new money are supposed to be done. It ends up you spend more money. Yeah, that too. Before we go on. Hello. The rest is all internal. So do I slide back to my station now? You may. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank, yeah, you. thank you, girls. Have a good day. Careful. Oh, come on. <laughs> she might want her. Thanks, Diane. <laughs> <laughs> they got everything else. Yeah, later. <laughs> well, nice evening, ladies. Thanks. Good night. See ya. I think as we move forward, um, Kent will be. Do you have anything to add, Kent? All right, Kent. I'll let. Okay. Well, can we talk so you, know, you can talk? talk. And I kind of helped try to bring this meeting together because we talked about, you know, we have several large scale costly projects kind of we've been working on with. We got engineering fees already embedded in them and everything, but, um, you know, the water tower uh, was one of those on the list. We've been kind of pushing that around here the last couple of years, um, you know, talking about that. But, uh, you, I mean, I think all three council people should have the thing with the arrow on the bottom. I mean, it's kind of the projects we're going to be talking about. Right. So. That's what he'll be gone off of. My arrow's pointing on Diane. Hey, what? Hey, get me. Point you. Just my oh. flip in the page. <laughs> SpongeBob. <laughs> Ron Jones. They just had one of those episodes with the arrows. <laughs> but anyway. I already know who I Okay. Oh, you got grandkids. <laughs> you don't have yours? I, I had it at one time. Yeah, I had it down to her. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. The old tower, as you all well know, is kind of outdated. We use it as a backup if needed, but we're still spending money on it to keep it rehab. We've done it a number of times here in the past number of years that I've been on council. So, you know, we've had a push from you know, the water department to, to take a look at a new water tower, uh, help with water flow around the community, pressure, and also lowering our uh, fire rating within the community uh, as our town has grown, and our town has grown over the past. Like no. raising our fire rating, lowering our insurance oh, I'm sorry, rates. That's right, raising our fire rating. <laughs> reverse, I apologize for that. Um, I was seeing what your guys' thoughts were. Uh, like I said, the committee's talked about it several times. I know the water department would like it built tomorrow. But, uh, you know, that's something we spent money on engineering report, and Pogo Myers brought that back. But uh, is that something we want to look at, at building in the next? And if we do want to build it within the next year or two, um, if we're going to try to find some, can we find some grant money? Yeah, but it needs some lead time. It right. doesn't happen overnight. But that would give us time to, to look at that. I know our cap had mentioned about maybe trying to help find that, uh, some grants, if there's any out there for that project. So, but that's over a million dollars, um, you know, for a decent sized water tower. That's we we already are on one funding list, list. as a candidate. Right. Right? So we are working behind the scenes to get this ready to go. It's, not the, it on a, it's not the ideal funder. But no, no, it's not. So I'd much rather find a different one. I would too, just want to wait. We are not waiting till the last minute. You right. say go and we go. We're trying to have all the ducks in a row. That's why we put it on our list for our future improvements. It needs to be budgeted. It is a costly project. They do have a site. We have a site. We, yes. I just need to be already spending this kind of money, and then pushing it off for five, ten years, and then cost more money to build. Oh, it's not going to get it's any cheaper. More um, expensive. We keep throwing. We keep asking for grant money and, and and some some debt forgiveness. But if we tell them, oh, we don't want to build it," she, they said, "Yeah, you may be able to get it this year." And then we turn around and say, "No, nah, we're not going to build this year." And then the following year, the same thing. Um, I don't think that's wise, but so I'd like to see it maybe come to fruition within the next couple of years. Well, we can go ahead and submit the permit to install those last five five years, or we can wait on that too. I mean, that part's not a big rush, but 
if you know you're not going to build it, say, for eight years, I wouldn't be sending in the check for the PTI. Right. So I don't think you can do it in 2020 at this point. We wait too long, though, then then all of our numbers and all of our uh, engineers' estimates, all that, everything will be wrong. Correct. And that's why we have it on here in 2021. Well, I think that's... A, you know, I think it's about think we should the continue earliest you can do it. Yeah. But that again, impacts our rate study we just had done. Yep. But it, it's one of those projects that's been deferred longer than I've been here because there's right. documentation from before 10 years ago. Uh, it's been deferred a long time and it is not getting any cheaper at all. But it also stops on that. We need to come here and shield <coughs> budget for. I have said for a long time we need to go time. with it. I was upset when we let it go the last time. Do we have any money plugged in anywhere for a demo of the of the little tower? Um, no, we talked about it at the time. Whoever's building the new one, um, if you want to take down the old one and. Haul it away, Take so it to speak. For it. This is what yeah. you're saying? I mean, you could bid it that way, but no, we don't have anything in for demo. So that's going to be a costly item. Or when it comes time to demo it, I know it was talked about putting it out for bid saying you can come take it down for free and you can scrap it and then say you load whatever you want to do. I mean, there'd be different ways, but yeah, I've got nothing in the budget for tearing anything down. But I also don't have anything in the budget for what we're going to do with all the antennas either. All right. Um, so if you're going to also, there, there's also going to be some extensive replumbing over there, isn't there? Shutting, shutting mm -hmm. valves down and rerouting valving. Yeah, you shouldn't have to reroute anything. Probably just cap everything off. off. But you might have to tell them. Cap them you, off and what you have reverse on. flow on something or something. They're going to lose their, they're 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 their antennas to take a height. I mean, I. Well, they should get, you know, a deadline to have their stuff. Well, and that's something else we need to know when that time we comes. We don't know that until we know the construction on the new tower date because we can't yeah. demo. Well, they can get them off beforehand. They can get it off early, can't they? Is there any reason why they. They can have a place to put it. Deadline to have their stuff off. We have a place to put it. Well, that's our problem. Not that's our problem. Our problem. No. Part no. of it is our problem, though. Everything I've because heard is this is the ideal. The 911 tower is up there. Right. Yeah. There's and that is the only there. place our 911, um, what's it called? Yeah, FAA, whatever, whatever, license is good for there within a thousand feet, which does not even reach his office. So, in that regard, as a community that relies on 911, why we couldn't you use that. the elevator? What, huh? Why couldn't you use the elevator? It's whole new licensing. It presented a problem. I don't remember all the details. Well, ev even for up. media common metal link, they say that's the ideal spot to reach over all the trees. Mm -hmm. and then media has got the whole building full of equipment. Oh, yeah, for so their the locals. Larry, I agree with you. That is their business conundrum, not ours. However, as a community that uses the 911 system, right? But I'm sure there's other towers around here. Mm -hmm. I'm just telling you. To. I'm just saying. I remember talking about this years ago, and that was an issue. It was a big issue. You'd have to build, have you have work to build one for us. Well, you can work with yeah. even American Tower for itself. Yeah, or by Elm Street, but yeah. then we're paying right. rent. So, get part of the rent money back and. Well, that just needs to be kept in, in mind. Oh, yeah, so there's nothing budgeted for... FWT will put one up for them. They talked about that we originally, about too. That. But you got to have the right location, which is right over there. I can't imagine uh, when you look at those towers from the countryside that the big tall one over there in the park wouldn't be a lot much better place than, than the little mm -hmm. one. But anyhow. anyhow. So we're looking at basically the tower by 21. That's move on that. The goal as of right now. I hope so. I'd like Sure, you might look on that. Well, I know we have more than one FCC licenses. Thank you. I you should not have it. <laughs> no, it's all right. Yeah, but it's got something to do with getting that signal from Defiance. Don't I? That you know, I'd, you'd have to talk to Bob Aaron on all our radios. Those, our, our police radios don't even work down there. Our new ones. Yeah, I know. So much for that fancy <laughs> grant. But <laughs> move on. That's not part of the. Okay. Yeah. 
another um, large project that's coming into more fruition here in time um, scheduling would be the uh, Chicago High Street storm, storm project along with the water main replacement on that. Uh, so okay. Um, the water main PTI, uh, Cheryl cut me the check, well, cut me the check, <laughs> cut the check for that. Uh, so that should be getting sent in shortly after they made a couple changes to the plans we saw. That's getting done next year. Uh, engineering's... When will that go to bid, Kent? We're hoping next May or June. May or June? Because we're going to do that in the storm sewer both. We've paid about, <clears throat> call it maybe 40% of the engineering already on that. Uh, then you can see that's when I applied for that grant. The storm sewer is going to be bid and built at the same time. Not really seeing any construction plans on that yet, so my estimated cost is still what they thought originally around 1.4. That engineering we've paid about only about 5% of so far. But those got to get done in 2020 no matter what. The sewer, because of the EPA phase two deadline, the water, well, if we get that grant, we got to do it. I sure don't want to turn down that grant. You'd probably never get another one. Um, and we don't have High Street torn up once. So I've got those both in the budget. And I know Ken has done a real good job of getting a lot of water line grants through his tenure uh, to help with some water line replacement. Also in phase two, though, is the Defiance Avenue and Ogen lift stations. And I know Kent sent out an email to committee here, or I think it was last week, and I saw Ron's response. There's a couple different options on that. So it's another costly expenditure that we have, and it's part of long-term control plan. And we actually, actually asked for a change uh, in our long-term control plan on that, that project. And, and I, I think they give us permission to do it, correct, Kent? We haven't heard back. We haven't heard back yet. So. Uh, and the only thing with that, and we kind of talked about that today, the price range, that 400 to 700, that could depend on what we actually end up with because the three proposals they gave weren't really detailed on the pump station. There would be different ways we could go on that. That kind of gives you an idea of what you might be looking at, minimum, maximum. But... Um, Depend on what EPA comes back with. If they say no, you got to stick that dopey force main in all the way to the sewer plant. This number goes out the window. A lot more expensive. Yeah. If they say yeah, go ahead, do whatever you want to. That's fine. But we'd also have the option, I think. Now, Ogen Street, I don't really talk about it. It just needs electrical upgrade. So if they say yeah, do whatever you want to. Uh, we're not looking at much there. Defiance Avenue, if you wanted to split it into two years, I don't know how that would work for funding. You could do the lift station, say, next year, keep sending it where it's sending it now since we've got, you know, till 2026. Then a later year, revise your piping. Like I said, I don't know, funding cost-wise, I mean, it's just an option probably be ideal to do it all in one year. I do have it in next year's budget, but it doesn't have to be, but that lift station just causes headache after headache. About this? Well, yeah. well, the lift station should have been done a long time ago, but then when we got roped into the force main all the way to the plant, that kind of put things on hold because we didn't know how to size all that kind of stuff. How long uh, will it take us to, to uh, deal with the railroad to let us go under? A few months, <laughs> easily. Yeah, yeah. And I think they had like 10 or 12 grand in their estimate to get all their permits and... So if, that, if this is really gonna come to fruition in, in 2020, I think we... I think we should make that decision and get started on it, or at least give Kent a, a rolling chance here to, to get the railroad on our side of the thing. Well, and then the next thing, I guess, with that is 
funding sources, some that we were kind of led to believe might work, you know, Roberta said probably wouldn't work. <laughs> so it might also be back to where can we get money to pay for the vast majority of this. That might push it off to 2021 just based on money. They might have to put up with another year of a <coughs> headache lift station. I, and that could possibly be a 10 to 15 percent uh, uh, cost increase. Well, yeah, then your right. costs go up. But that one grant, if we would qualify it for it, we could have probably have gotten about you know, up to half a million. Would have paid a very good share of that. What changed in that? She explained, she'll come back to explain that in a okay. later meeting. Um, so that, I mean, I can add it to my list of stuff to have her look at to kind of get a timing scenario. If it would work for 2020, I'm all for it. If we can't get any money for 2020, though, you might, I mean, that's a big chunk of change. Like I said, I think next year's budget could handle it out of the, I call it the income tax capital projects. It's the old fashioned name for it. but. If you can get free money to pay for most of it, then so that one's kind of in limbo. But I'll find out what she said. So you're checking with Roberta then for that grant, or yeah, she told me to send her a list of projects, and she kind of start narrowing down. Okay. I mean, there again, I know we could borrow it all, but I hate borrowing when you don't have to. But our, our options are there so that we could possibly make a definite plan now to do it. Yeah, we'd have to finalize. Well, no, we'd have to choose an engineer. The contract I received was going to be over the bid threshold anyway, and there are some things in it I didn't like. Anyway, I didn't think would actually work. Long story. So we'd have to get an engineer on board, get that contract hammered out, because we can't really finalize stuff till we know who we're talking to to see if our ideas work. So it's kind of a well. I'm what I'm saying to finalize is is to finalize it amongst us that we are going to well, pursue this in 2021. Yeah, we should be hearing from the EPA fairly soon because they didn't even want the review fee like they did on Chicago Avenue. They said, "Well, this is totally different." I said, "Are you sure before we send the study in?" Without any money, you guys said we're asking for a change Hopefully in the change of change of plan. They said, "No, you're just kind of changing." The lift station, they didn't care what we were doing to that. I mean, that was up to us. They said, yeah, if you're pumping it somewhere that's got capacity, they didn't consider that a real big change from a force. I said, that's fine. Right. It saved us a couple hundred bucks review fee. I just hope they don't send a letter back saying, hey, this had to go through the formal and a lot more paperwork. We kind of got the expedited, you know, cheapo <laughs> uh, review. So I think it'll pass. But anyway, yeah, I can find out. Um, and a question on these kind of projects, so like that project with with the um, the station, and then the um, right the storm, then, and then also with High Street in Chicago, we are spending a little bit of extra money for oversized piping in case we need to do any <coughs> CMOS projects to add anything to it down the road for other portions of town that are not separated. Yeah, well, the water means not. I mean, right, we're outside right, in that right, anyway. But, but I meant the, uh, the lift storm. station. Uh, there again, it's got to depend on if we're running it to a fort. Or, I mean, that's one of those, I, I need a lot more information before I say let's it go with the cheapest. Gravity. Well, right. or the most expensive. I just got questions. Uh, but I'll run I didn't understand on, on their uh, uh, what you sent us that, that gravity installation gravity is more expensive than the force made. Short of the size and pipe, I, I, I can't believe that that there's two hundred thousand dollars difference in in that. Something's wrong there. Yeah. So anywho, I'll send it off to Roberta. Since we're still waiting anyway for the EPA, it's not anything I need to know right off. Or I'm hoping to hear shortly, but. We'll see what kind of funding might be out there. So uh, the other issue that I want to discuss is the well field. We have not gotten final. Yeah, I was really hoping projections. so that you'd have an idea tonight because I have no idea so far what we've paid Jones by the end of the year. I'll put it this way: known expenses because we'll have Jones Henry's five thousand done probably their next invoice or whatever. 
they've got soil tests done, the electrical scan done, whatever that is, the survey done. Well, I've spent fifty-five, seven eighty-five on just the call it the pre-testing studies, and so. Whenever they get done looking at their rocks, I don't know what him and Clifford are doing, <laughs> but anyway, they're going to come meet with the committee and then say, okay, the next step, this, this, with estimated cost, and then if those come back good, then the next step of actually installing it, these estimated costs. I don't have that right now, and I don't even want to try to guess. They're doing geologic now? They're done with all the they pre stuff. They have the results. They're, they're studying them. Studying the results. Uh, so then they'll come and tell us. Since you said they'll come tell us, I'm assuming all that stuff passed. Otherwise, you'd say, hey, it all failed. Forget it. So they'll come and explain what the next. We're going to have to do a test well. And I'm sure there's going to be some more geological junk with that. Are they going to look for arrowheads? <laughs> Don't even say that. Well, they will. They about shut the sewer plant down because they found one. So just no, I'm I'm serious. We had it done in our industrial driveway. People lived it. on. Our it was mandatory. Yeah. But anyway, so I don't have any information on that. Because I was also hoping when they would come, if they would give us yes, it's 99.9 percent .9 confident you can buy the land. All right. I just, I, if he'd come back and say it's a 75% chance, until he do the next test, everybody's still hanging on buying the land. Mm -hmm. I was hoping, yeah, definitely, because I can tell everybody on TV and stuff, if, if it is feasible to buy that property and have a good supply of water, uh, you're talking many, many, many years down the road that we have a good well site mm -hmm. to supply water in the community. But, so I guess you could say, let, let's assume, every, and I'm, I'm not an optimist in this case I will be. If everything, they come back and say, yeah, it's 110% certain you're gonna hit water, we'll do the next steps. Um, will you buy the land yet this year? Because I don't know when they come in to do a pre-drill, the next test That's well. well. See, I don't know how long the family wants to keep waiting either. True. I mean, so is that 451 get spent this year or part of next year? I don't have it in either I, budget. I see that on capital project plans that that's uh, split in well, 19 yeah. and 20. They, <clears throat> yeah, for their purposes, do they, they, had do they want two out. payments. No. Oh. No, no, no. But our cap was just figure in half. Okay. Half that was for their. For their Figuring out where it's coming. They're spreading out. the money out a little farther. The option to purchase for. I don't remember. I don't know. August thirty first. But I guess even if everything would come back, you probably wouldn't be doing anything in twenty twenty, would you? Construction. You might have to do a pre test or pre test test drill, clean up some of that stuff. But I don't think there's money for next year to actually start drilling a well. And piping. Isn't that what we were talking about borrowing, though? That was the money they were setting aside for repayment of debt service? No, well, but that was 52000 well, well, But see, if this comes in like a million bucks, are we borrowing a million bucks? She's, so that was a conversation you had with her. That's how she I just told her to stick it in there. Okay. Would we have to build? I mean, if it's working for us, do we have to go build a well within the next four or five years? I mean, or is our current well? Well, yes. I wouldn't wait that long. Yes, just, I can answer that one. I'm just asking. Definitive I, answer, yes. We want to build one right away. The new one we put in three years ago now has already had to have more maintenance than the old one. It's not a great location. It's the only location we had available to us at that time. So we are making it work. We are already short of uh, the regulation that we have to have a contingency of three, where you should have one that's running now, one that's a backup. If that one goes down and you need to have a third in reserve so that, let's say, well A is being worked on, your own, you're operating on well B, what if something happens to B? You have to have, 
we have a rule of three in the water industry. Uh, if you go through the water plant, we have three high service pumps for that reason. We have four filters for that reason. You have one that's operating, one that's reserve, and one that's emergency. Right now, we only have two wells, and one is already giving us problems out of those two. So to say, do we have to have a new well in 2020? I'd like to. Don't say we have to. In the next four or five years, I pretty much guarantee it, yes. Do we have a projected engineering cost of getting raw water to your plant? No. No, we don't have any cost. That's what they're study supposed to with what they find, how much we can get back, and then determine what size pipe is reasonable. So this will be done by the people you've already employed? Yeah, that's part of what we're supposed okay. to be getting with them. The first step was find out, can we even get water out of the ground? Right. A sufficient amount. And then, how do we get it from there to here? And then let's build the thing. Jesse, what problem are we having with that well? The same as the old one that we abandoned. It's bringing in far too much iron and gravel from the ground. We put a smaller screen size in there to try to sustain how long before we brought in the excess iron and gravel, but it's still happening. Is it at the same depth? Similar. The same vein of the aquifer. Mm -hmm. But that was our only, our only um, available location on village property that remained. Was about a five foot circle and we used two feet of it. Mm -hmm. We had to get special permission. And we had to get special so waivers so and permission to, to even use that five foot circle. So they were gracious and allowed us to do that a few years ago. And we have no more options. I know the park seems vast, but to meet regulations for having your source water, we're out of options there. So I hope that explains why I reacted so quickly. Yes, within the next four to five, absolutely. I can put it on Roberta's yeah, list for 2020, maybe. but now you got a couple two million dollar water projects mm. in 2020. Whose chain, who's chain do we have to rattle to uh, to speed things up out there a little bit in that well field or, or water field? Jones and Henry. I would have thought he would have got back with me before now on some dates. To run past people. Right. I that, actually thought we would be meeting this week, and then because we had a time, we had a time restriction on purchase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Council Pastor. news, newspaper, Jones Henry waiting on reports. <laughs> That's That's rattle, rattle or chain? Is something you can maybe get back I'll to by next Monday night? Be mean to them. Mm -hmm. The testing weeks. was delayed because of how oh, wet. The yeah, that out. pushed yeah, things off a little weeks. bit. Um, not just the ground here, but the ground everywhere. These con these testers had contracts with other places before us, got held up. They did get in and did a good job. Uh, both firms got all the testing done in one work week. Um, trying not to work on top of each other. They did a really good job. They got in, got it done finally. And now we wait on the analysis of those results. Do they, do they know? That we are working with a time restraint to on yeah, our. You should know everything we know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. anyway. Yes, because they actually helped us with. Well, yeah, making they sure said our stuff to Troy. In the agreement, were um, mutually beneficial. I'll get with Pete tomorrow and find out what's going on. Wonderful. Um, yes, otherwise we're down to what industrial dry. industrial dry project. And on those. The water's ready for a PTI soon. They're getting, I've, I said, don't worry about getting that sent right in. We're about three fourths done with the engineering on that, and that's for only design. That's got, got nothing to do with after. And on the sewer, um, we're about three fourths of the way done on the design engineering on that. The, there's going to be some lift station stuff. The price might lower initially, but we'll maybe have some added expense down the road if we get industry. I'll explain all that some other day. But anyway, you got the rough prices, and it's just back to what year do you want to slot them in? The last I saw of anything on on uh, the sewer for that, 
they were reversing it and bringing it back to the lift station that's there and forcing it up to Usargon. Hopefully yeah, that plan has been eliminated. Mm -hmm. you're, that's what you're still planning? Yeah, but they gotta redo the lift station. Might not be as expensive. I was thinking and hoping that we would go over and, and tie into the school. Well, we've got that option, but your price tag just went up tremendously. Because it adds a, a lift station plus footage. A oh, lift station to get to the school? Let's see. Again, this isn't my end of things. I, 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 I didn't hardly believe, but it's the the grade that's at the two existing points didn't provide us a way to connect them. That's what they were asking for. Okay. The grade that's at the two existing points didn't provide us a way to connect them and still get gravity to, to get fall to all to either one direction or the other or both with the existing grades we have out there, which is where the repair to the industrial park existing lift station comes into play, it would need to be deeper. Uh, so I hate lift stations and I hate pumps. What's that? I hate lift stations and I hate pumps and all they do is cause uh, problems and create expense plus the expense of installation. I mean, look at that sewer plant. It was a gravity plant since its inception. Came in, put a new one in, now we pay a $10,000 a month light bill. There's no need in it. Gravity works around here. Well, the issue we ran up against on that sewer and a thing, you pay half again more to go put in the extra lift station and go the other way, and we don't have customers out there right now. Right. So that's what he was saying. If industry came in, there would be an expense in the future, but because we can't tell the it's privately on farmland on both sides right now. So it seemed like an excessive amount to put in now, not knowing what to build it for. Because you know, you know, I know, but installing water and installing sewer lines are kind of opposite. You can put in the water and pressurize it to wherever you want to pressurize it to. The sewer has to be on a grade that's acceptable to everything that's coming into it. So we would have to have quite a crystal ball to, to design that 100% on the loop with nobody out there right now. Well, to or a degree. Or them go increasingly uh, deep. Yeah, but I mean, we don't need to go deep because maybe, let's just say that there's houses out there and, and there's 15 houses and one of them put a basement in let that basement put a pump in his basement, not us. We did that on High Street. That sewer is so deep that it would, it would take a big contractor to come in and, and do any tie-ins or any repair work to it for one basement. Also, by wastewater regulations, we are supposed to be making people remove the pumps out of their basement. Exactly. So if we're going to put in a sewer that requires them to put a pump in their basement and we're telling them you can't have a pump in, you know, we're, we're creating circular problems. Well, we've got a storm sewer down here that, that would take a, a extremely large contractor to get into it to put a pump into it. It would be, the cost would be exorbitant. It'd, oh, it's just scary to think what it would cost to get a into that storm sewer to put a pump into and it. Those are the regulations. Yeah. So have to work yeah. 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 I, know. I know, but I just I was trying to explain to you why, after all the meetings and all the engineering options, why we had discussed in that meeting to stop it at 49 for now, because it was about half again more cost on a guess. Right. But and what I'm trying to, to to display is is it might cost more to do it today, but like our sewer plant at ten thousand dollars a month, it doesn't take long to pay a bill to have done something different. I'm done. I understand what you're saying. You're, 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 uh, you're one call. One point uh, I'm just gonna round off to a million. It'd be like a million one. I forget how many hundred thousand I was gonna add. But we can always change stuff later on it. Sure. I guess at this sure. point, it's just what year do you want to try to slot this in for? Because there's going to be a ton of easements and right away stuff and whatever to work through. If we say, okay, we're doing it next year, which I don't think we would be, that they'd have to be getting started on. But again, with the funding cycles the way they are, we have it. You're not going to get much 
that ain't going to qualify I for that. your hack on that. I understand that, but we're, we're sticking the regard on them, so I'm going to keep my fingers crossed for now. But we tentatively have it scheduled construction across the end of 21, beginning of 22. And I think that's when they stuck it in. Right. Do you foresee any big you or any user coming in and buying any of your 40 acres? The thing is, is I just had a discussion with Jerry Hayes a couple days ago about it because we weren't on the op sites for Northwest Ohio, and I asked him why, and he says, well, because you're not an extent and you're not ready. I'm so, ready. you know, I mean, if you want to sell it as an industrial park, you have to have it ready with utilities and stuff. But so, you know, it, it's just the way it is. And, That was another thing, Ron. The reason we did complete the loop on the water was because dead ending it wouldn't be able to bring um, industry in no, because of their ISO industry. rating wouldn't be high enough. That's why we had to loop the water. Yeah, that was just a good idea. Oh, I agree. Yep. But there was actual substance behind it to try to draw in more potential business. Yeah, I understood the water. I just I'm failing on the sewer. So I guess it's a gamble if somebody wants to buy it and then you got to rush to stick it in or... Well, we can put a sewer in by the time they build a building. I don't care at all on this, that you, just so we know how to slot it in for budgeting. Mm -hmm. didn't, didn't we make an agreement with the purchasers? No, we're we past that. Mm -hmm. and at this point, I don't think they care necessarily on the end of it. I don't think the family's worried about it. Okay. <coughs> keep everybody happy. So if you just keep it on your unknown list, but don't let it fade away to, I don't say two years. Oh, well, nobody told us about this. Got it. Whoever's still on council at that point. So I'm, I'm not planning to stick. Well, I know it's not in for next year, and I wouldn't really be looking at 2021, 20, but who knows? Oh, and my costs don't include engineering on that since we're paying the design stuff up front. The added engineering is not included in those. And then otherwise, you got the phase two stuff that you keep hearing over and over. Chicago Avenue, we talked about already. And we haven't even talked about New Sargon and Elm in that area as a part of phase two. So, Well, yeah, that's that northeast neighborhood. You get a couple more years figure out where you're either sticking a pond, which I think's not going to help CSO any, or doing another study to recommend we're doing something else. Other. And I'd like committee to look at that, um, because after talking to you a little bit, um, we do have some designated storm lines farther out that we can maybe tie in some storm drainage and alleviate some of that. There is a storm line going up Elm over to Defiance Avenue, but I think it would pull some of that water out of there and help it and move it back to a different area without spending a lot of money. Um, but we're going to go with the pond, you got to start buying land. Yeah. So, so that's, you got a couple years to worry about that one. Well, not really, but on paper you got a couple years to worry about it. Bottom line, it sounds like a lot of projects and a lot of money, but we, this, these things have been, we have been working on these for years. And it's just we spread them out, and now we have some more coming into fruition in the next year or two. Um, they are expensive, and then not only that, but other projects that pop up over time and uh, opportunities that arise, and um, try to be proactive on the stuff for the future. So. That's what all I had. I know we went, refuge is not on the agenda, so I don't think we have a, I can't want to address that. We can talk about that utility. later. Tonight. I'm going to go make one more copy. Yes, I just one more for you. Utility rates. It's utility. I mean, you start to talk about it, I'll just be a second. Oh, Kenneth brought up several times. Look. Huh? The look? Talk about that. No, we're just numbers are numbers. Numbers are numbers. The fund is broke. You guys should not have lowered the cost because now you have to raise it back up and that always causes problems so you have to deal with it right. or else 
What are you going to do? The fund after next year. I don't even know how Kent student budget this year. I get it the refuge fund to meet the numbers mm -hmm. that I needed to meet. But anyway, um, on refuge, I guess before I read my scenario, I gave you because that's got some of the increased water rates. If you'd add a buck a month to your trash bill, you're on, and I'm rounding up because it's close enough. You take an extra fifteen thousand a year. If you add two bucks, you'll get thirty thousand. Three bucks would be about forty-five thousand. I don't know what Whirler's increase will be in 2020 or 2021. And right now, with it being $14, we pay Whirler's $13.31 per customer. So basically, you're saving 69 cents out of every dollar to pay for a lot of expenses that you can't afford anymore. And since we're on tape, you should mention what those are because right. I explained that to somebody the other day and they had no idea. The recycle lot, which is not cheap, you get your street sweeping, your leaves sucked. We can give up leaf sucking. <laughs> uh, people wouldn't like that. They don't want to give up the recycle lot. Um, they don't like giving up street sweeping because they're still mowing grass out there. Uh, they get their mosquito spray in. Now I see there's a new kind of mosquito flying around killing people. So, so it's stuff we can eliminate. I'm trying. The public's not going to like it. I can't shift. Well, I could for this year, but it ate up our increased gas tax revenue to, so the street department could take over all the expenses I used to pay out of refuse. So there again, it's going to be a one-year band-aid, and it cuts back on the amount of paving you can get done. So, but I, it depends on how much you want to generate a year to put back in the refuge fund. Well, with your budgeting and refuge funds with wages and all the things you had just mentioned, I mean, where where do you think it needs to be? To well, I've got it scaled back to three hundred thousand because that's the number she said I'm going to have us available to spend. I think what he's asking you is what increase do you think what we increase need? do you think right? Well, I had to move about sixty thousand, I think. And that was after cutting it the year before. So right? You need three dollars a month or twelve dollars a month. What do you need? Well, three dollars gets you forty-five thousand extra a year. But I said I don't know what Whirlers like is going to need. Yeah, you just moved yeah. sixty. You just moved sixty. Plus so. money the year before right. I moved. So you need more than yeah forty-five or whatever. if you want to, you know. Street can do it, but I said at some point even street then is not going to be able to do it. Well, do we want gas tax money used for that, or do we want streets paved? Got to keep our streets paved. But yeah, I don't know where, where is they might eat up a dollar a month increase. I don't know. Can, let me ask you if you could do this for us, Kent. Could you uh, touch bases with Perler and and get a general idea of what they're I thinking? I kind of did. They haven't got back with me. Well, you'd do it again and way. tell me you got you got angry people on council that need answers and uh, see if you can get us. A, you know, just if he says, well, I think it's going to go up two percent or maybe three percent. Uh, okay, you know, just so we've got a general idea, so that you can come back, let Mike know as 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 the president of the committee, so that we can sit down and do a little figuring. Uh, you've already told us about 45 that you figured, 60 that you already spent. Uh, give us an opportunity to try to put some numbers together, uh, so that we can come back to council and go, hey, we we need to do this or this. If you want to keep all these services. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. See, that's going to be quite a hit if you're using your water 15% and you had, let's say, even at $3, or $6, and then your possible sidewalk fee, there's, you know. Well, anybody that owns a house knows it that it needs something, something constantly. Oh, well, I know. A, car, a house, a car, there's something it needs constantly. And the village is exactly the same thing. It needs something constantly. Cost of business. Yep. And that's where 
the elephant room still gonna be sewer. That's coming next. <coughs> so that sheet I just gave you and Sheila, and I'd give it to everyone sooner. I ran the new rates for the little old ladies on minimum, and then an average user of about 5,000 gallons. And you can see, I figured $16 for trash. I mean, that might not be accurate, I just used it. I included your $3 sidewalk fee just for 2020, from 2021 through 2022, that sewer, they, those all stay the same. I know that's not going to be right, so my numbers are very conservative. But you can see what you know, the fixed income people are gonna be paying in the year 2022 compared to now without touching sewer and without changing the other two. And then what if businesses will really feel the hit on the rates. They might not feel that sidewalk fee and they don't pay trash. But your users might think you're really piling on here with a lot of fees. But these numbers are helpful. We appreciate you breaking mm -hmm. them down with the average 5,000 gallon usage per month. What's our average person? Is that somewhere in that range? It's about 5,000. 53 or something. But you can go through, since Roberta gave you the sheet, you can use her projected, you know, with the increases. You could pick somebody using 8,000. Just remember to add in your trash. I mean, so you can run your own numbers. I just did a couple to. I, th I think the only number that, that we don't have would be your hurler increase. So. Yeah, I'll see if they can get me something. And uh, Cheryl, when you get audited, because I know with utilities, the water, the sewer, and the, the refuge, they look at, they fine tooth comb those numbers to make sure that we are charging appropriately, looking at our increases, looking at our debt ratios, um, everything. And when we don't collect enough, they, well, they let you know. <laughs> Well, yeah, the auditor puts it in the report, but the main thing is if you don't collect enough, you're not going to get the grants and the funding that you need to do your projects. Your rates have to go along with that. And these these they three things are... You're not going to help yourself, we're not going to help you. Right. And these yeah. have to be self-supporting and, and self-sufficient. Right. Because you can't take money from yep. other budgets and well, other bank means of revenue to, there to help pay for those. Those three have to pay for themselves. Yeah. And funds. Yeah. So that's where... Don't forget that. It, you're correct. That's a good point. Yeah. So that's where for people saying, well, you got so many million in the bank. Well, sorry, we don't. And you can't transfer all the general fund into the water fund just to no. save raising rates. And and even if you did, it's just a band aid. Well, right. maybe a long term band aid if you if you transfer enough, but it's still a band aid. So we have to find a way to make the thing liquid on its own. You know, I'll throw this out here, and people can fire me if they want. You <laughs> wish. Please do. <laughs> Back when Tom Fishball came the first time, like 15, 16 years ago, do 3% every year and people never ever notice. And councils never followed a single recommendation our cap ever gave us. They invented their own number. No. Not, not back 15 years ago. Like a heart monitor on the sewer fund. We cut the garbage fund about three, four years ago because it was sitting so good. I know they cut sewer and everything. No, uh, and then we had to raise it back up. I complained when they cut it. I said, you're going to have to turn no, around. Like I was saying, they didn't listen to me. Past 20 years and probably even before, councils don't take advice well on rates by independent studies. I could see them telling me or Cheryl to take a hike. I mean, that's, that's one thing. When you have an outside source telling you, oh, yeah, they deal with this stuff. They kind of got to. So it's got to be a hard sell to the public when they see that stuff. Well, it's not going to be a hard sell because you got to kind of mark it as sold. We just have to convince them that it's, there's no other alternative. I mean, we don't have a choice. We, you know, if they go, well, I'm not going to pay it. Well, 
Yeah. Like, I mean, help 60 it. people a month now that don't. We already said this. The last thing we want to do is raise people rates. But everything in this world goes up. Everything. Right. I don't care down. what you look at. Food, and they know gas, that. They know And one thing that I had to remind the guy that I was talking to the other day, every time we sit here and agree to a raise, everybody at this table pays the same raise. We're not getting a discount or anything. Right. So... Nobody. Anything else, kids? I got stuff to do if we don't. Real quick, I want to thank Jesse and Dawn. They had worked in Gerald and Kent on that asset management plan. Uh, it's been a process. Um, I want to thank everybody that's been here at the meeting. I want to uh, tell the public that we are transparent. If you have questions, please ask. If we can't get the answers, we need to get the answers for them. They might not like the answer, right. but... Well, uh, see, that's something you have to be... And Roberta doesn't know yet but what we just went through with the water side. Yeah, we're doing the GIS with the sewer, but that asset management sewer is coming next. I don't know what year that number is going to be astronomical. Mm -hmm. So that might be one you might want to start looking at your rates sooner rather than getting <coughs> the atomic bomb dropped on you, say, two, three years from now. Well, I think, I think when you give... Mike, the numbers, and we sit down, we start hammering this thing out, then we also need to incorporate into those numbers a one, you two, do three, at least four, five percent increase. Sewer at the same time to kind of head off the... Yes, yes. Because we got probably at least $23 million of assets Only one. on the sewer end. Oh, I'd <laughs> say far more because you're running two pipes. Oh, yeah, oh, probably... No. You got storm, you got sanitary. sanitary. So that won't be pretty when we get stuck with that. And some of them that we've switched over and, to, and made storm out of sanitary are not going to hold up. We're going to be working on them. Yeah, if they leak, it's just storm water. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway. Thank you, Bill, yeah. for, for recording in. this. Can I make a motion to adjourn? Sorry. And I'll help you. Even though I had this Eric's not here. This meeting. Yeah. I'm covered for Eric. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, everybody. I had to get that in still. I'm sorry. Oh. No, she doesn't. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm the adjournment. I thought you didn't do that on the adjournment. We did this. Well, what took a vote? That's on an executive session. Oh, Eric and Larry are always out here like super Special council. Uh -huh. Thanks. Er